Um, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, so I have uh, a, a background in physics, did a PhD at the interface between physics and computing. And for the last year and a half, I've been leading our, our research and development efforts in reinforcement learning at uh, Indus.ai. I'm going to start off by, uh, uh, by talking a little bit about um, reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is a field that has a huge amount of potential when it comes to uh, optimizing decision making and control processes uh, for industrial companies. Um, we were one of, so even though a lot of academic labs work on reinforcement learning, there are a lot of publications on it, it's a field that ha does, ha does not yet have a lot of traction in, in industry. So we were one of the first companies to start a dedicated applied research and development lab in reinforcement learning in the middle of last year. So it was a, a complicated process. We learned a lot in that process. And uh, today I'll be talking about what we learned, um, especially concerning the use of open source resources. A couple of words first about who we are. Uh, Indus.ai is a private research and development lab in machine learning and artificial intelligence. We're also a solutions provider um, for industrial companies. By industrial companies, I mean companies that, uh, whose business model is not uh, uh, digital, so I'm thinking transportation, energy, et cetera. Uh, so we provide solutions in, let's say, uh, classical machine learning uh, paradigms like time series analysis, speech recognition, et cetera. Uh, we also have a dedicated um, research program to help us provide solutions in more difficult fields that are learning from bad data and decision making. So we have a few publications and are working uh, with academics on those problems. Um, so first of all, I'll be talking about what reinforcement learning actually is and what it's good for. Uh, and kind of to see uh, why reinforcement learning is quite hard and how open source resources can help us with it. I'm going to consider a specific use case, which is reinforcement learning for, uh, a sm for smart homes. Why smart homes? That's because it's a, they're a complex system that we can easily relate to, and they're also a perfect test bed for reinforcement learning applications. So, what is reinforcement learning? Uh, reinforcement learning is a field that tries to create agents that will learn uh, to maximize a given predefined objective directly through interaction with their environment. So uh, there's a notion of an agent that interacts with an environment uh, by applying actions to it, and the environment responds to those actions uh, by uh, going into a new state, so giving a new observation to the agent, and also potentially giving it a reward. So why is learning from reinforcement learning different from other ways of building intelligent agents? I'm going to take the example of training a dog to sit. Now, you can kind of imagine two different ways of doing that. The first way is the engineering approach, where you kind of... Uh, try and map out the skeleton of the dog, figure out where all its muscles are, how they work, specifically which muscles to contract when to achieve the objective. And then you have to explain that to the dog, and that's going to be difficult. The second option is uh, where you reward the dog when it sits when you want it to. Don't reward it when it doesn't. After a while, it will figure out how to do that complex motion on its own to achieve that objective. Uh, so that second approach would be the reinforcement learning approach. So there's a lot of potential for creating self-learning agents uh, that can accomplish even pretty difficult tasks that are hard to specify. Now it's a field that's been making a lot of progress recently, especially thanks to neural networks. Uh, there have been quite a few high-profile successes, especially in games. So specifically, if we look at uh, 2016, uh, a reinforcement learning algorithm was used to produce an AI that could beat world champions at the game of Go. Uh, that was really impressive. Uh, 
and was something that arrived a lot sooner than most people thought. Uh, since then, there have been really uh, high-profile successes in complex real-time real games such as Dota and StarCraft. Uh, and on top of all of those academic, uh, uh, those demonstrations on complex video games, there are more and more academic publications, more and more academic labs uh, working in the field. So to really understand uh, what reinforcement le learning is and what, defer what makes it different from machine learning, let's look at a few uh, examples here. In machine learning, you typically have uh, a fixed data set. Uh, that will be what you learn from. Reinforcement learning doesn't require data. It requires some way to s simulate the interaction between an agent and an environment. So it needs uh, a, a simulator that will provide that environment that the agent will be able to learn in. In machine learning, first you collect a data set and then you learn. In reinforcement learning, you learn through interaction with the environment or the simulator of the environment. Uh, so you, because the agent will have to learn to explore the environment, find the right experience, and learn, that ex and learn from that experience all at the same time. Also, machine learning is a much more mature field in terms of industrial applications, whereas reinforcement learning, uh, is, I've written here, it's a new field. It's not a new field in terms of academics, uh, in terms of academic research, but it is a new field in terms of industrial applications. In machine learning, uh, you cannot do better than the people who provide the labels for your data. At best, you can do as well as they can. But in reinforcement learning, you can definitely outperform human-specified systems. So nowadays, the best chess players, the best chess-playing AIs, are made with reinforcement learning, not with uh, heavily hand-engineered systems made by, uh, designed by, with rules designed by humans. Now, reinforcement learning has uh, a lot of potential applications. It can work in any field in which there's uh, a system reacting to external stimulus. So if we think back about that loop between the agent and the environment, uh, that's a system reacting to a stimulus, which is the agent's actions. Now, a few examples of uh, like what known applications of reinforcement learning are here. Uh, in healthcare, you have a human body that reacts to a treatment. Because of that, uh, you can design reinforcement learning um, systems that will act as digital doctors or do dynamic treatments. In recommendation, a customer will react to an advertisement, um, not just in a single way, but through several interactions with a website. Uh, so there is that loop between the agent uh, which is a website, and the environment, which is the agent's reaction. And uh, Facebook, for example, uh, uses reinforcement learning uh, to suggest notifications to users on its platform. It can also be used to link between different newspaper articles on a website. Thermal control. A building will react to heating elements. Uh, so you, uh, it's been shown to work, reinforcement learning has been shown to work uh, to control uh, heating in Google's data centers. It can also be applied for 3D printing, industrial ovens, etc. Robotics is a field that a lot of people are interested in, uh, in reinforcement learning, in terms of making self-learning robots. Uh, so that has applications for delivery drones, sorting robots, robotic tool use, etc. And now on top of those specific fields where applications are well known, Reinforcement learning has applications in many other things like logistics, data networks, et, et cetera. However, despite the potential use of reinforcement learning in those example use cases, there really have not been a lot of industrial applications. Uh, why is this? So uh, let's do a bit of role playing and imagine that for some reason you've been asked to design a reinforcement learning system for a smart home to improve thermal control. First of all, is this a reinforcement learning problem? Yes, it is. You clearly have a dynamic system that reacts to external actions. Uh, the observations you have from this system can be the th thermostat readings or um, energy consumption readings. You, you also have actions that will affect the state of the system uh, by changing the air conditioning 
or radiator controls. So this is definitely a case where reinforcement learning can work. But I'm going to show it's not going to be easy. So uh, difficulties arise in several aspects. First of all, uh, there's a, a, a human uh, reason reinforcement learning is difficult. Uh, first of all, so if we think back about the, that slide earlier where I told what uh, uh, I said what the difference was between machine learning and reinforcement learning. In, in a lot of industrial companies, it's already hard enough to get people to think in terms of how machine learning can help. And now reinforcement learning requires another different mindset. So it can be difficult to get people to recognize how reinforcement learning can help. Uh, you also have very little expertise in the field outside of academia. So the question is, who's going to build those systems? That's going to be tricky. Open source, uh, open source reinforcement learning can really help here. I'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, also, reinforcement learning requires you to build a simulator of your smart home or uh, be able to let your agent interact with the smart home itself. Uh, building a simulator can be difficult. Building a system that will explore uh, its environment in real life is often a hard sell in terms of industry. And the last one is, will uh, the person you, you're, you're building the system for trust your reinforcement learning algorithm to control its system? Now, on top of those kind of human difficulties, you also have really, uh, it's, uh, reinforcement learning is still a really hard technical problem on its own. For several reasons, here are three of them. First one is, you need a lot of computation. Uh, so for example here, in this specific example, it took 100 years of simulated experience for a robotic hand to learn to manipulate a cube. Clearly, this is not scalable if you want to control larger systems. And it can be impractical uh, for your smart home if you need to equip it with a rack of GPUs. There's also a problem with generalization. So if you look at this example here, where you have uh, a little red car up here, uh, driving around a racetrack. You can definitely train the car to drive around a racetrack with reinforcement learning. But if you change the background color just a little bit, the car will just spin around in circles. Um, so this is a problem if you want to, de to design this for industrial systems. If you think about your smart home, uh, if there's a heat wave and it sees temperatures it hasn't seen before, you want to make sure your system will not go completely haywire. And uh, kind of a last problem, which is a bit, uh, a bit more subtle, is that it's often difficult to say exactly what you want your uh, reinforcement learning system to achieve. So that's a general problem, not just for reinforcement learning. Like generally, finding good incentives is hard. And an anecdote that I really like is that is the COBRA effect. So this is something that happened in colonial era uh, uh, India. So at the time, uh, a lot of people were being killed by cobras. And so the colonial administrators decided that uh, the best way to solve this problem was to give money to people who gave them dead cobras. Um, so pretty quickly, cobra farms started to exist, and the number of cobras ex exploded. So clearly, that was a problem of wrong incentives. Uh, and this can also be a bit of a problem uh, even for a smart home, for example. Now, we've seen it now, when it comes to those technical problems, um, open source resources can be expected to be really helpful here um, for several reasons. One of them is it's hard to find people who are able to apply reinforcement learning uh, in practice. So it's really helpful to be able to build from uh, open source uh, algorithms and simulators. But then also, open source, uh, open source has been hugely successful in machine learning. Uh, like you have a lot of uh, resources now, like Scikit-Learn, TensorFlow, PyTorch, et cetera, that are really amazing. They have democratized machine learning, made a lot of people who are not experts um, be able to deploy those uh, machine learning systems in a lot of ways. Um, however, it turns out trying to apply 
uh, reinforcement, uh, using open source reinforcement learning is not as easy as applying open source machine learning. Um, now, there are several differences between them. One of them is maturity. Open source machine learning has been around for a very long time. Uh, Scikit-learn has been here, has been around since 2007, and it has had academia and industry in mind. Open source reinforcement learning is a lot more recent. If we look at OpenAI Gym, which is one of the most commonly used open source reinforcement learning systems, um, that's only been that was only developed in 2016, and is still mostly used for academics. In terms of the way uh, code is structured to it too, it's, uh, there's a difference. Open source machine learning provides the algorithm, but it's up to you to provide the data. For reinforcement learning, you, c you, you want to be able to use open source for both uh, the learning algorithm it itself and for the simulator of your environment. Now, there are a lot of open source reinforcement learning resources available, uh, all of which can be helpful in, in several ways. Uh, generally, I've, I've made three categories here, which are open source environments, uh, so um, uh, open source simulators of specific environments for you to train your agents in. Open source algorithms, too. Uh, so in, in the same way that there are open source machine learning algorithms, you can get open source reinforcement learning algorithms. And also frameworks that can combine environments and algorithms and different ways to deploy them. Let's have a look at some of them. Uh, environments, first of all. Oh, one thing is you'll notice that uh, several of them, oops. Here we go. Uh, several of them have the word gym in, gym in them. Uh, that's because those are environment simulators in which you train an agent to make them stronger. Uh, so you, you have a lot of different uh, simulated environments in there. A few examples. PyBullet uh, allows you to uh, simulate uh, a robot. Uh, DeepMind Lab is uh, really good for training agents uh, that can uh, navigate around a maze. OpenAI Gym has a lot of different environments. A, a lot of them are uh, games such as Atari. And the last one here, which is actually not, not open source, but I've put it here because it's, it's quite cool. It's a, uh, an, an environment, it's a, a physical environment. It's open access that allows people to uh, train and test reinforcement learning algorithms on actual robots. Now, uh, those environments are great for what, uh, for what they do. However, none of them is going to help us uh, build a simulator for the smart home. So typically, you're going to have to make your own reinforce reinforcement learning simulator for the system you want to deploy it on. Now, let's look at open source algorithms and frameworks. Now, having open source re reinforcement learning algorithms is fantastic because it means that you don't need to do all of that work yourself, in principle. Uh, they're great because they allow for straightforward comparisons between algorithms, so you can figure out which one is, uh, will work best on your problem. Some of them also support distributed calculations, which is a way to uh, solve the, um, uh, the issue with the amount of computing power that, you, that is required. And also, some of them are designed for specific industrial applications in mind. So for example, the last one here, uh, Facebook's reagent was designed specifically to optimize recommendation systems with reinforcement learning and was used to optimize uh, Facebook's notifications. So that's all, that's all great and really helpful, but there are quite a few issues with those, uh, those algorithms and frameworks, which makes, which makes it really difficult to use them in practice for anything else. Uh, first of all, they're designed for specific environments, which will be the academic benchmarks. So a lot of, a lot of algorithms are designed specifically for video games, and they're not going to work too well on anything else. Um, so they're not easily customizable to whatever other problem you want to solve. Also, a lot of them uh, are written by researchers, not developers, which means code quality can sometimes be a problem. And finally, uh, there's a big reproducibility problem. So here, uh, the graph that's on the right is uh, uh, learning curves, so the scores 
reached by the agents as a function of amount of time spent interacting with the environment. Those three curves are supposed to be uh, three identical algorithms, except they were just uh, implemented in three different open source ways. So they're all supposed to be the same algorithm, but clearly they don't work the same way. So it's quite hard to figure out actually which one of those implementations you should trust. If you can't trust them, you probably shouldn't be using them for a real world industrial application. Which means that if you want to build a reliable uh, reinforcement learning system, you're probably going to have to build your own systems. So this is something that, uh, so by looking at all of the open source resources out there for reinforcement learning, we were able, uh, it, it helped us figure out what the best way is to apply reinforcement learning to the real world. So to face the problem of unreli unreliable and opaque open source frameworks, uh, we, built we built our own reinforcement learning framework with our own implementations of algorithms, uh, specifically with research and development in reinforcement learning in mind. This is something which we plan to open source so we can uh, benefit from uh, the open source uh, community, uh, especially the academic community. We also found it fantastic for gaining the skills that we need in reinforcement learning. Uh, but of course, if you don't have the time uh, to, uh, 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 to build your own dedicated reinforcement learning team, you're, you're more than welcome to use our own framework. To solve the problem of un unsuitable open source environments, uh, we realized it's best for us to make our own proprietary simulators this time. Proprietary because we're working with industry experts trying to simulate their core systems. Uh, and to solve the disconnect between academia and industry, we found it's quite helpful to have kind of your own res um, research and development team that will be able to talk with academics and figure out how their tools can be applied to solve your problems. So let's, look, let's go back to the smart home and uh, see kind of what, uh, what I think is probably the best way to, to approach this problem. Um, so first of all, you, you need a simulator. Uh, this is something that we would build uh, with industry experts uh, in, 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 uh, in the construction industry uh, using templates that come from open source resources like op OpenAI Gem. Uh, which we would then validate using real-world data to make sure it works. On the other hand, we'd be working on uh, building our own reinforcement learning framework um, from the ground up, but also using open-source machine learning tools like PyTorch, uh, which we would benchmark on academic environments to make sure that they work. Then we would combine the algorithm and the simulator, make sure our algorithms solve the problem in simulation, then apply uh, then do some real-world tests to make sure everything works, and then go for deployment. Now, I also said that reinforcement learning is uh, difficult not just for technical reasons. There also are human reasons that make it quite difficult. Um, so we've seen that it can be really helpful if you want to uh, deploy reinforcement learning systems to spend time uh, evangelizing managers and people to make them think about the type of problem that reinforcement learning can solve. Um, also, we found it's quite helpful to, uh, uh, to solve the talents problem, to actually go out, engage with students at universities, get them interested. It's a really interesting field. Um, it's quite easy to get people's attention, and it's really essential to get the uh, uh, people interested and get the talents that you need to build those systems. So uh, kind of the messages I want to get across here is that reinforcement learning is a relatively new technology when it comes to industry, which has a huge potential impact uh, on industrial companies. Um, we've, what we've found in the process of building our own activity in reinforcement learning is that at the moment, open source reinforcement learning activities, well, well open source reinforcement learning doesn't quite rise to the challenge of crossing the divide between academic work and what industry actually needs and wants. Uh, and to be able to solve this problem, what we've done is created a dedicated research and development lab uh, that is working to try and cross that divide. 
Uh, thanks a lot for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Actually, perhaps uh, a segue and a transition to talk about open AI, because we've talked about uh, AI and open source, but open AI, can you tell us more about this entity from which you, you will be building new software? Because I'm not sure everyone is familiar with this initiative. Everyone knows TensorFlow, PyTorch, but what about open AI? Yep. Where, where does it come from? Yes, so um, uh, open AI uh, uh, is really interesting. It was uh, s it started out as a nonprofit in California uh, with a quite a lot of funding in order to help um, uh, d democratize AI. So both so, so so doing kind of open research in reinforcement learning, uh, developing ways in which uh, developing open source tools that would help that would help people actually advance uh, uh, knowledge in artificial intelligence. Wasn't it, wasn't it created as a reaction to the progress that Google made with DeepMind, in a way? I think it's, it's quite possible. Uh, the fact that uh, DeepMind was bought by Google uh, kind of was a, a bit worrying because they have a lot of talent in this, in, in this field. And, kind of, and, and it, it is true that they tend to keep all of that inside Google. So there's a huge potential for DeepMind, for example, right. I think, to to um, solve a lot of industrial problems, which they don't do because they just work for Google, right. as far as I understand. Um, apparently, though, uh, OpenAI seems to have gone, have, seems to have changed its status and gone from non-profit to for-profit, and I don't entirely know what that will entail. Okay. But I'm curious to see how, where that We're goes. We're curious to, to see what's going on, but clearly with the open source community, uh, often it's been about code, just code, but now it's getting more complex because we're talking about code, simulators, data sets, so it's a lot more than open source. It's about open data mm -hmm. and open simulators, and you need hardware to run them. So uh, we'll see how that evolves, and we're looking forward to, to see what you come up with. Thank you. Thank you.